And now, from Mountain Bike Central in Marin County, California, here's Greg Lewis. Hello again and welcome to another week of action in the Mountain Bike World Cup. Today, we're going to bring you coverage of the racing from Park City, Utah. And this race is significant for a number of reasons. It's the last of the three American events in the Mountain Bike World Cup. And so far, the Americans have swept the races on this side of the Atlantic. If the Americans can pull it off again in Park City, they will have an excellent chance of capturing the overall titles in the World Cup Finals later this year in Berlin, Germany. Let's go now to Tim Blumenthal, the mountain bike editor of Bicycling Magazine, who's in Park City. Tim, what's this course like? The course here in Utah is very technical. It's not a long circuit, only five miles around, but there are many tight, twisty sections lined by aspen trees. And at 16, 17, even 20 miles per hour, you have to be alert. You can't let your concentration slip for even a second because you'll crash. Your handlebar will hit the aspens and you'll go down. So that, that's really the main thing that makes this course different. There's one other element that has to be reckoned with, and that's the dust. It's not as hot here as it was in Michigan, and we're not as high elevation as we were in Mammoth, California. But it's very dusty, and it's going to be a very fast technical race. Well, Tim, this is the final U.S. race on the World Cup. Can we expect the Americans to continue to dominate the racing? Well, David Weens had such a marvelous race in winning last week at Mammoth. He would have to be considered one of the favorites here today. But really, Rishi Graywall, who's leading the World Cup Series overall, has been so strong in the U.S. portion of the World Cup Series. I look for a strong performance from him. One other on the men's side is Ned Overend. He's Mr. July, Mr. August. As the season moves on into the shadows of autumn, Ned Overend gets stronger. So I expect him to do well here today. On the women's side, well, we've had upsets too. Sarah Ballantyne has moved past Juliana Furtado into the overall lead in the World Cup. Ballantyne, she's very strong. I'd have to say, though, that Furtado, week in and week out, may be stronger. So I would expect a comeback from Furtado. All right, Tim, thanks. We'll be back with the start of the women's event right after this. Stay with us. The Mountain Bike World Cup is brought to you by Grundig Electronics. Grundig, a proud sponsor of the Mountain Bike World Cup. And by Bud Light. Everything else is just a light. Three truths in cycling. You're only as good as your equipment. No matter what, there is always a headwind. And finally, there is never enough time to ride. What would the classroom be like without cable? Cable companies across America have made a commitment to provide free service and programming to every secondary school in their communities. Cable contributes to life. When you're looking good, you want Bud Light. The clean, fresh taste won't fill you up. And never let you down. Well, you can taste it, you can feel it, you know you gotta find. Everything else is just a light. Just keep your bad lines on. Everything else is just a light. Brace yourself. For the mountain fresh scent of mountain fresh dial. Hi, I'm Tommy Sanders of ESPN Outdoors. Each week we show you the beauty of our environment, but let's remember to preserve and protect the only Earth we have. You can make a world of difference. Is row number three. The eyes of Ruthie Mathis and the smile of a winner. She was the victor in Mammoth. And now Julie Furtado and Sarah Ballantyne wearing the overall leader's jersey in the Women's World Cup. 
Getting set for the start of this Park City finale to the American part of the tour. On the far left, Regina Stiefel. She'd been the leader when the circuit was in Europe, but now she's been faltering. Julie Furtado in white. She faltered last week at Mammoth, California, where she finished eighth. But otherwise, she's been nearly invincible with three World Cup event victories. Still, she's six points behind Sarah Ballantyne, setting the stage for a great one-two All-American battle. Set for the start. Regina Stiefel in the yellow and purple pushes out hard and uncharacteristically Julie Furtado does not sprint away to try to take an early lead on this demanding course. Well, it's a 20 mile race, four laps of a five mile circuit with the most interesting part you can see on the right. It's called the spin cycle. It's a twisty section of single track and the riders are in it on the first lap. 60 downhill turns in less than half a mile. So is Regina Stiefel, who was the early leader. And right here, Sarah Ballantyne over the top and in trouble just moments into the race. Well, that's really going to be tough for Ballantyne. It looks like her handlebar is twisted. This is an unexpected break for Julie Furtado and uncharacteristic of Sarah Ballantyne to have trouble on a technical single track. Furtado passed Regina Stiefel, and she now sets the pace on the uphill climb and dropped way behind by her misfortune is Sarah Ballantyne. This is Regina Stiefel in second. Ruthie Mathis, she's showing the same good form that she did at Mammoth. She should do very well on this wide open section of the course. She's a great climber. A great climber because she's a fine road racer and also because she has a background as a Nordic skier. So she's got that, that aerobic ability and power. But power alone won't be enough on this course because it presents more technical challenges than any of the other stops on the World Cup. Those technical challenges will have to be met four times on this five-mile circuit. Now a different kind of challenge, how to pull yourself back up after you've been over the top and had to stop and adjust your handlebars. Sarah Ballantyne giving it her all. And look at Regina Stiefel. She is having a great deal of difficulty through the switchbacks. And probably with the altitude, because the low point is 6,800 feet. But look at Furtado. She is motivated today. She's trying to escape the nightmare of Mammoth last week. Mentally, it's probably the toughest race I've done because it was, it was kind of embarrassing um, in front of that many people to have a really, really bad day. But uh, I just think I, I was tired, and I, I wasn't listening to my body, and so I've rested. And I expect to be a little flat here, but hopefully not as tired. She's not a little flat now. She's climbing with good form, being pursued by Ruthie Mathis, who cannot make the climb on the bike. Yes, Mathis is a great climber, but this is a mountain bike climb with loose soil and loose rock. Sarah Ballantyne on her way down. She's 30 years old. She's 214 behind, but she has got the veteran's experience to catch this woman, Julie Furtado. 13 miles to go on lap two. Julie Furtado looking very strong. Ruthie Mathis keeping her in sight, and that's crucial, Greg. Furtado negotiates the ever-twisting course in Park City. You can't say how difficult this is to steer your bike through these narrow sections at high speed. And I think this is where Julie Furtado has a big advantage over Ruthie Mathis. Germany's Regina Stiefel in the yellow. The American courses have frustrated her, trailing or dogging her. It's Sarah Ballantyne, not used to being behind, but enjoying this year's different competition. I'm really glad that I finally do have some competition this year. I think if it were to continue on, as in years previous, although it sure is fun to win all the time, but you do lose some motivation. No loss of motivation here. She's got to catch Julie Furtado in the white. Right behind her is Ruthie Mathis. Mathis is again climbing well. She's coming up on Furtado. This has to be Furtado's worst nightmare. Ruthie Mathis is an unknown quantity, having raced only one World Cup before this one. And she won that one, and here it looks like she's heading towards victory again. Darcy Dangermon in third place. The tortuous descent. Well, frustrating for her. She goes down. Not only are the turns tight, but the track is full of washboard and roots. But Sarah Ballantyne handles it well. And think back to 1990. Until then, Sarah Ballantyne was invincible. But then she lost the world championship to Julie Furtado, and she's made a career of chasing Furtado ever since. 
That was a year ago. This is today. The same story for Tato out in front with eight miles to go. And look at her bear down. And Mathis, she took the lead on the lap before on the climb, but here she's suffering. She's lost it. She's dropped to second place, and she seems to be fading. Ballantyne continues to press forward. She's in third place now. If Furtado wins and Ballantyne yes, is third, Ballantyne will keep the World Cup lead. Ballantyne has her demons to fight. She wants to prove that Furtado's not the best. Furtado wants to prove that what happened in Mammoth down. was a fluke. And Ruthie Mathis on the last descent to the finish. Oh, she's down. And that's a clear statement of the difference between her and Julie Furtado coming across the line. Making Mammoth old history. It's a victory in Park City. But we'll spend a frightening night with the Discovery Channel and Cox Cable. As the full moon rises, so will the hair on the back of your neck. As ghost ghouls and goblins pay you a visit, yes, your worst fears come alive with spooky apparitions and bloodthirsty creatures. <laughs> ghost ghouls and goblins, Thursday, October 31st at 9 p.m., only on the Discovery Channel. It's on cable, Cox Cable. This new water mattress by Strata has a money-back guarantee, and only Strata offers this individually adjustable support zone. A Strata water mattress is so comfortable you can sleep through almost anything. Aren't you glad you don't live in California? It's madness. Markdown Madness at Waterbed Emporium. We're cleaning house and marking down everything for immediate clearance. It's madness. Up to 50% off. Make no payments for six months. It's madness. Markdown Madness at Waterbed Emporium. To a cornucopia of sports on ESPN. Feast on the ESPN Sunday Night NFL. A full course of college basketball tips off, and the U.S. Davis Cup team plans to serve the winning point. College football teams are looking for a seat at the bowl game banquet, and the first around the world balloon flight lifts off. An abundance of sports in November on ESPN. Yeah. Julie Furtado wipes away the grime and the memory of Mammoth. It's a victory for her in Park City. And here's Ruthie Mathis in second, a full minute behind. It was the descents that were the problem for her. But still, a credible result. A good fight. She lost by more than a minute, but she hung in. The results from this competition for Tato number one, Mathis in second, Ballantyne third. It's the USA all the way through the top four. And yes, Sarah Ballantyne does finish more than five minutes behind, but that perseverance pays off. Her problem, of course, the crash. But Sarah Ballantyne, nonetheless, remains on top in the overall standings by one point. Furtado in second. Now the men get set. David Weens coming off of his victory in Mammoth moves toward the start-finish line. Can he carry his momentum from California to Utah? He's trying to catch the World Cup leader, Rishi Graywall. Graywall hopes to repeat what he did in Traverse City where he picked up a victory. And John Tomac, the flashy, stylish rider, looking for his first win. And Ned Overend looking for any kind of good result. How strange to see an elite mountain bike scoreboard without Ned Overend's name on it. He's in seventh place. Risha Graywall leading with 90. Gerhard Zdrobelek of Austria, he's not here. Assembled at the start. Watch Rishi Graywall. There it is, the patented push right off the front. Graywall sets the pace. Mountain bike racing starts are getting faster, and the main reason is that the course is narrowed down to single track. Here at Park City, the course climbs and then drops, climbs again. But the key feature, again, is that spin cycle, that narrow single track. And the riders are approaching it on this first lap. Rishi Graywell out in front, sets the pace. Tomac in second. Henrik Dernice is in third. There's a leap of faith that you make racing in a field like this at high speed and close quarters. If a rider makes a mistake, you go down and probably the 10 guys behind will fall too. The dust rising. Another obstacle on this race course. Some of the competitors as we go into the spin cycle with Tomac. It's amazing to watch how fast these riders can go through such narrow terrain. Graywall. And then Bernice bounced about. One mistake in here could prove disastrous. There's Tinker Juarez. 
and David Weens. Look at how quickly they come, one after another. It's just impossible to see what's ahead. You just have to watch the back of the rider in front of you. Rishi Graywall makes a big push. Janice riding on his wheel. And there's John Tomac as we reach the top of the climb on the first lap. We're at 7,400 feet now. Tomac seems to make the adjustment from sea level in Europe to mountain biking in the Rockies very well. Tomac showing more than just style and flash today. The descent. John Tomac is one of the greatest descenders in the sport. Sometimes he gets a reputation for riding with reckless abandon, and sometimes that brings him flat tires or worse, crashes. But he also has a great record, and now he's back concentrating on mountain biking, looking for his first World Cup victory. Tomac out of Durango, Colorado. He's used to the mountainous terrain that we have here in Utah, quite similar to his home territory. Rishi Graywall behind, and now it's Tinker Juarez who has moved up. It's a good position for Risha Graywall, but not so good for Ned Overend. He just doesn't look smooth. This is really a surprise, Greg. A year of frustration in the States for Ned Overend. You can see Tomac in the distance. He's trying to get himself out of sight to break away from Rishi Graywall. Graywall, though, so tenacious. And this is actually a good position for Graywall. Not in the lead, but close. John Tomac, a brief interlude of pavement as we end lap one, five miles gone, 20 miles to go. Tomac, a little bit of water there, so important to avoid dehydration. Arishi Graywall on the road right behind. A look of conviction on his face as he heads back on to the mountain terrain. David Weens, he's still close. And so is Ned Overend. He's moved up into fourth position. Back on the spin cycle. And John Tomac, Mountain biking's best bike handler shows us what descending is all about. For a ski racer, it's an occasional bamboo pole. For John Tomac, it's a forest of aspens. But it's not the only obstacle he faces here in Park City. The back climb especially is really, really warm. So um, uh, I think the heat will be a factor, but hopefully the race, I don't think it's going to be really long. At this pace, John Tomac will ensure it won't be long. He's the leader in Park City. Brace yourself. For the mountain fresh scent of mountain fresh style. I've never heard anything like it. It's a video that speaks for itself. Is that a tennis match? In a language that's all its own. Call this toll-free number now and find out what everyone is talking about in this fascinating video, The Hidden NFL. It's free with your paid subscription to Sports Illustrated, the best way to capture all the drama of sports. This is the NFL, which stands for not for long when you make them... Hidden mics and hidden cameras let you in on the NFL secrets in this fascinating video that you'll watch again and again. Who's in charge of the replay? Call now to subscribe or renew for a full year. 54 issues, including the swimsuit issue for $1.29 an issue. Save over 55% off the cover price. The free video and a year of SR. Great gifts for the sports fans on your Christmas list. For faster delivery, use your credit card. Call now for your free video and to enjoy all the excitement of sports every week with Sports Illustrated. Back in Park City, Utah with 18 miles to go. Rishi Graywall suddenly the leader. Big surprise while we were away. A flat for John Tomac, and he has fallen way back. It's Tinker Juarez in second. This race has changed all around. And now another development. Ned Overend, he's moved up into third, just 48 seconds back pushing towards the two leaders. Rishi Graywall trying to exploit this opportunity with Tomac. Well, so far back, it seems impossible for him to catch up. And usually it takes about two minutes to fix a flat tire, but Tomac has lost much more time than that. In fact, he's five minutes and 28 seconds down. Something is wrong. Well, in mountain bike racing, changing a flat is an eventuality that every racer must face. But if it's done well, as we see in this demonstration, it should never take five minutes. This is world downhill champion Greg Herbold showing us how it should be done. 
You know, in mountain bike racing, racers are obligated to make their own repairs. You're not allowed to have any assistance. Which is very different from road racing, Tim. How come there isn't neutral support here? It's the spirit of mountain biking. It's the idea that equipment should be trail worthy, that if you get caught deep in the woods, miles from civilization, by yourself, that if your bike breaks down, you'll be able to solve the problem yourself without a big repair truck there to help. But in fact, wasn't there a move from the European contingent to uh, have that rule change? Yes, Greg. They wanted the same thing as in road racing, but they didn't get it. The Americans pressured for the support yourself rule, and that remains. And that's why it's so important for Greg Herbold and all racers to know how to do this and do it quickly. And for Herbold in this demonstration, about two and a half minutes to change the tire and put it back on. So what happened to John Tomac on this race course that cost him five minutes and 30 seconds and the lead as he was yeah. going for his first win? Well, Tomac tried to inflate his flat tire with a CO2 cartridge, but the tube exploded. So he was left standing there for several minutes until a teammate came along and finally provided him with a new spare tube. Well, that could ignite some controversy because that is considered outside support. We'll see how it develops. Here's the leader, Rishi Graywall, on the descent through the spin cycle. He's looking great. He manages his bike very well through this very difficult section. This is where he likes to be in the lead. Rishi rides best when he's in front. That's a lap rider up there. Tinker Juarez in second place. 12 seconds. Nifty handling there. Gray Wall's looking pretty strong. And now we know why he's earned the nickname, the Iron Long. Ned Overend, as always, riding fast but within his limits. That's what separates him from the others. He knows what he can do and what he can't. Tinker Juarez on the open road. The heat beats down on him. He's in second place, 16 seconds behind. He's had a good race so far, but he seems to be struggling a bit now. And he's had good races in the two previous U.S. stops on the World Cup, finishing fourth in both. So he carries momentum into this Park City finale of the American Swing. John Tomac, big cheers from the crowd, but he is six minutes back. Ned Overend is moving up, now only 38 seconds behind. Overend has found the pace. Now, Ned, do it for us old guys. And he's still looking very steady, very determined. This is Ned Overend at his best, the world champion at work. And he's the highest paid racer in mountain biking. The, one of the oldest, too, and a man with a reputation that goes well beyond the United States to Europe and even Japan. John Tomac fights on. He's had a lot of bad luck in the USA. 1990, the World Championships, he was sixth because of a flat that cost him two minutes. What's bad for one is good for another. Rishi Graywall took the lead because of Tomac's flat net over and then able to pass Tinker Juarez, who has now dropped to third. Then Rishi Graywall has his own flat and over and moves out front. Turnabout's fair play in mountain bike racing. And suddenly it's a scene that's reminiscent of the World Mountain Bike Championships last year where Overend soloed to victory. <laughs> Pulled up the mountainside by the adoring cheers of the crowd in Park City. And back behind Graywall, he's fixed his flat tire in about two and a half minutes. He's back, but he's sixth place. Here's Tinker Juarez in second. One of the difficult descents. And he's tired, you can tell. He's tentative, he's having trouble controlling his bike. The grandfather of the sport, Ned Overend, is in his granny gear, making this steep climb, starting the final lap, but he's riding like a young man today. But for most of the season, Overend has struggled. He's been lucky to finish among the top 10. You got it. He's really shown his age. I'm seventh in the World Cup, so uh, I'm not doing as well as I would like. And it, it causes me to uh, think about how I'm going to change things next year. I'll need to start training earlier next year. I wasn't, you know, I, I did my typical plan where I kind of race into shape. But there's the races early in the year are so important in the World Cup that you can't really afford to race into shape that early. Oh, oh, oh.
Tinker Juarez is finding out that Overend has raced into shape. He can't catch him. And coming up here, it's Tom Rogers, who is ninth after the first lap, but he is now pulling up and threatening Tinker Juarez. And there's the chant. This is the way that Ned Overend imagined his entire season would go. And now, finally, it's happening. Flat's a big part of this race. There's John Tomac on the right. On the left, Rishi Graywall. Both had a chance to win this one until they punctured. Victory today, though, goes to Ned Overend, his first win of the World Cup season. Shower yourself with a new sensation, new refreshing shield. Feel the blast. The high energy beat of Shield's unique skin invigorating formula. Refreshment that'll turn you around. New refreshing Shield. Stump jumper, and it's the world's most popular mountain bike. But then, who says you need a mountain to ride one? Get the thrill of a lifetime every week without ever leaving your home. ESPN's Adventure Tuesday. First, relive Olympic history with the award winning series The Olympiad. Then, go beyond your wildest dreams and back with Expedition Earth and witness some of the games people play that are truly incredible on Amazing Games. You'll never forget the experience. Adventure Tuesday premieres at 8 Eastern on ESPN. You're watching ESPN, the total sports network. The Mountain Bike World Cup has been brought to you by Norba, the National Off-Road Bicycle Association, the governing body of mountain biking and by Mountain Fresh Dial, the refreshing deodorant soap. Not champagne, but a big splash of H2O for the champion of Park City, Ned Overend. He's been Tom waiting for this one. 24-year-old Tom Rogers from California is in second after having been in ninth after the first lap. So a good, strong finish for him. Tinker Juarez comes in almost two minutes behind in third, but it is his best showing of the U.S. races. Thanks. In the standings, all USA. Overend, Rogers, Juarez set the pace, but Overend, the big story. How does it affect the season-long standings? Well, Greg, it really doesn't. Although Rishi Graywall looked like a winner midway through, after his flat tire, he still managed to limp home to sixth place. Now it's one, two, three Americans with Graywall leading. Sedrobelec didn't race in the last two U.S. stops. He's in fourth place. Tim Blumenthal, the inaugural World Cup has come to our shores. We've had three terrific events. Now the circuit's going back to Europe. What's your analysis of these American events? Well, Greg, one of the things I liked about these three U.S. races was that each was different. In Michigan, we had sand. In Mammoth, California, we had high alpine heat and pumice soil. And here we had a dusty course, very, very technical. Really three excellent races, all American winners, both men and women. Well, different races, all the same outcome. The Americans on top set up now after having taken advantage of the home court to go back to Europe and perhaps win the overall inaugural World Cup titles. For Tim Blumenthal, I'm Greg Lewis. So long for now.